things and my dad and his dad and his dad had all been engineers so I did engineering um, but that's probably the only reason why yeah so our business really started um, because me and Ian my, my co-founder wanted to own and operate businesses of our own I mean very easily with our background we could have gone and raised a fund and become private equity and done all sorts of things down that path but really what we wanted to do was like own our own business you know get scared running it <laughs> and work out what it actually takes to have completely the buck stopping with you how has that journey been so far has it been scary at some yeah place? really scary okay. yeah really scary definitely for maybe five years before it got a little bit less scary year one was like honeymoon period isn't this great like we're running our own business and all that kind of stuff year two was like okay now it's a bit of hard work year three was like holy shit um now like this is serious not least of which because we actually bought another couple of businesses in that year like we actually had quite a few plates spinning you know some things didn't go exactly as planned and you don't really understand working capital until it's midday on a wednesday and you've suddenly realized that um, payroll is due at 4 p.m and the debtor that you thought was going to pay on Tuesday actually isn't paying until Thursday. Like, that can make a massive difference. And you can do all the working capital modeling and all the working capital analysis and cash flow forecasting in the world, and that won't change that problem. I think really walking through the fire on that stuff over the last few years has been really valuable. So yeah, there's definitely been some scary times and I think it's been a real test of our partnership um, and I think we've passed that test. There, there have been plenty of times when it could have blown up for sure. You do need to manage risk. Probably spent 10 years of my career as a risk management professional so it's kind of in my blood to have safety nets and buffers around. Now I've never been skydiving and probably never will. Like in terms of risk appetite that's probably a little step too far. But it's like the equivalent of asking someone who's been skydiving, how often have you had to pull your safety shoe? You know, you pulled your first one, it didn't work, I had to pull my safety shoe. Or someone who does scuba diving and saying, how often have you had to use your, your emergency tank? Like your other tanks run out and you had to go to your emergency. So it's that kind of feeling. So we had the ripcord to do the safety shoe. We had other things we could do to make it work doesn't make it any less scary when you've jumped out of a plane and your primary shoot doesn't work i'm pretty sure those guys still have a little moment of panic <laughs> when they're forced to like pull their second and only shoot it's called sro technology it, it operates in the predominantly you'd call it the bulk materials handling sector mainly mining but some quarries um, and some food and ag exposure as well and what it does is it produces installs calibrates maintains the instruments that measure the the weight and volume of the material as it moves around the site so it has for example the primary piece of equipment is an instrument that uses load cells to measure the rate of material running over the conveyor belt and they might use it when loading a ship or loading a train or having material come out of the process plant so they can say we're running currently at 500 tons per hour or th those kind of measurements so we do those that particular niche this was probably one of the only times we went through this exact process because after we did this investment we actually started to get a little bit of i guess you call it a reputation for what we were doing and so deals would come to us more often than we'd have to go and find them buying a small business is a little bit like buying a investment property there are websites you can go to and brokers you can go to we went to all those websites went to all those brokers we probably looked at 200 businesses met with 50 I think we submitted formal offers on five and we bought one. So that was kind of the ratio through that process. Interestingly, one of the other of the five, mm -hmm. we bought two years later. The attributes we were looking for was something that was big enough so it had some momentum, but small enough that we could afford it on our own because we didn't want to raise funds from anyone else. Reasonable track record good kind of maintainable earnings at whatever that level happened to be, good blue chip customer base, reasonable macroeconomics, just a big enough industry that we were small enough that our growth wasn't going to be impeded by movements in the industry as a whole. Okay. If you're 1% of an industry and you want to 
double your business to 2%, it kind of doesn't matter if the market is going to reduce. A bit of a niche play, so we're not just electricians, we do the instrumentation piece, which is a bit more niche, and just an ability to grow. In a pure business sense, I embarked on social media um, at the beginning of 2019. And so one element of that was I wanted to um, learn a bit more about storytelling as a communication technique. So I got a coach, um, his name's Mick Mooney, teaching me a lot about storytelling as a, as a method and a structure. Only just in the last couple of months, I've now been sort of building out profiles on, on Facebook and Instagram and those kinds of things. And interestingly, um, TikTok's come up a fair bit. I went to the um, Gary V session that he had here in um, Sydney a few months, um, last month or whenever it was, and he was talking a lot about it. We're now going to try and work out kind of what method I can use to get some of the content that I've been producing and kind of repurpose it into a language that, that works on TikTok. Someone said once, remember that it's social media, not just media. So I think the element of being social on those environments is important and shouldn't be forgotten. And I think that being social on those environments requires some vulnerability because people connect much better with a person than they do with a brand. And they connect much better with a person who's real. And to feel real, you need to be vulnerable and be exposed to failure. So... I think that's something that's really important is if it's too contrived, it, it doesn't work. I think the reach is really good. I think there's a few kind of technical issues that are different for every platform, which makes it quite complex. And that's something I'm still learning about. It's kind of like living in Europe and then speaking French and German and Austrian and English. And, you know, though that's kind of a bit how you need to think about it. We have seen some direct benefit from the use of social media in our business. And we definitely have clients of ours and investments of ours that have seen real benefit from social media. That benefit that I've actually seen so far is not enough to justify the amount of time and effort I'm gonna be putting into it. I think what justifies that is my gut telling me that in five to 10 years, whether it's those platforms or some other platform, the mechanism of that style of engagement is gonna be important to understand how to navigate. I think it's terrible, um, and and I think the reason why I don't mind if it's I don't mind if it's obvious. So I don't mind if it's clearly AI. To, to be honest, I don't. It's not like I care in terms of I don't get upset about people using it. I actually get upset for them if they're using it because I actually think it's going to be a problem for them. Because what will happen is you'll either generate a massive network that's useless because it's so diluted in its construct because AI has just been kind of building up this network for you. From my own personal experience, I've actually really enjoyed the direct personal connections I've got through engaging on social media. And I think you miss out on that if you've got AI involved. Like there might be people engaging with me on here and the AI is doing all the response and chatbots and all that kind of stuff. Like it might build some momentum, but I actually think that that doesn't outweigh the benefit of actually really engaging with that momentum. Okay. Engagement is always broader than what shows up in the metrics. So quite often I'll be sort of just walking through the city and I'll bump into someone that I know and know well and hi, how are you going, whatever. And I'll know they're on LinkedIn, but they haven't engaged like I might have put out six months worth of content and they haven't touched it once like and I say, oh, I really like the stuff that you've been putting out on LinkedIn. Oh, I particularly like that article you wrote around this, that, and the other. I'm like, I, I haven't even seen you on there. It's like, you know, um, being at a party and they're sitting like behind the couch, not even on it. You know, what I mean? like, yeah, they're, they're, not even, they're not even there. I mean, if you think about your musician example of 5 million followers and 10, 20 people buy the album, you've got to be really careful just assuming because you've got 5 million followers, you're going to sell 5 million albums. And I think it's the same with any business or any kind of personal brand. Like there's no perfect correlation between those things, particularly as your following gets that big. But I guess that's the other thing. They, they have spent a lot of time talking about micro influencers and people with between five and 10,000 followers because those networks are much more dense and probably um, more active than a, than a big network. I've been following his stuff for a little while now and I just really like he's got a very raw approach to everything and I like the way he can distill what can be relatively complex kind of messy issues into just a really blunt this is what I think type statement I really like that 
whether or not I agree with every part of what he says, I just like his ability to come to a position. And also I like his kind of raw New Yorker type approach to, to talking, um, which is kind of entertaining to watch. No, he was good. I mean, w- when we saw him on stage, I, I actually um, wrote a short article after that about his approach to being on stage because I think everyone was very surprised and some people were disappointed with what he did on stage because when he came out, he was really chill. Um, and everyone was expecting him to come out and like swear at everyone and kind of yell and scream and say you should be doing this and that's fucked and this is blah 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 because um, that's what he does right that's his persona but he came out and he was really really calm quiet considered same message but just really calm and considered and I kind of didn't mind it because I'd seen so much of his stuff that I kind of could translate what he was doing to what he was trying to say and I didn't really need the big bang fireworks Gary V. it was like going to see Metallica or Nirvana but they were just playing an acoustic set. And I think some people imagined that they turn up to kind of ANZ Stadium or whatever and they're expecting, you know, all guns blazing to come out and they walk out with two acoustic guitars and a set of bongos. So a whole bunch of the audience might be disappointed, whereas I I actually really liked it as a kid of the 90s and with a massive love of Seattle grunge. I actually really like MTV Unplugged and those kind of sessions with Nirvana and Pearl Jam and Live and all those guys. And then I met him afterwards um, in kind of the after session, whatever it is. It was very, very short because obviously he was like flying in and out. So it's not like I got to sit with him for hours. But one thing that really stood out was when he engages with anyone, he really engages with them. So like if you walk up to him and you have like a 30 second conversation, you feel like, he's completely yours that would that's a very difficult trait to learn i think so that must be something that's inherent um yeah really engaging personality i think it's the way in which he does it because i don't think he makes people feel stupid i think what he does is he makes them suddenly realize that they knew what they should have done all along they just needed someone to tell them Quite often, that's what happens. Is is they'll ask him a question. Oh, I was thinking about this, and I thought I'd do that, and I thought I should do this, and mother. And he and he just comes out and says, "Well, surely you should just do that." And they go, "Yeah, you're right." But um, but particularly, I, I listened to a podcast where he was talking about raising kids the other day, and kind of all the pressure on young sports men and women, boys and girls, um, in the US at the moment. And like he swore a lot in that because I think he's really passionate about how ridiculous that whole environment's getting in the US with pressure on kids to achieve at sport. So he does get quite passionate about that stuff. And I think that's what resonates. I don't think it's the aggression or the swearing. I think it's the passion. And was down at the beach and met the babysitter who happened to be my mum. Okay. And then uh, he, my dad was meant to stay in England um, and work for the family business and um, become an engineer and do all that sort of stuff. But uh, he quit all that and moved to Sydney and wow. became an architect and married my mum. Hey guys, thanks for checking out this episode in a series where we interview business leaders, tech innovators and startup founders about their business journey, insights and reflections. If you find value in this, please leave us a comment below and also like, subscribe and hit the notification bell. Enjoy! Enjoy!